Good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. This is Mike Volkoff, and we're here for uh, an FCP review of 2016, quite a big year. Um, and uh, the slides should be available through the resource um, that is uh, available. There's a resource sheet on your screen, and there should be a way to download the slides. If you can't get the slides, feel free to email me afterwards um, at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com, and I will be happy to send those to you. Uh, again, if you have trouble um, downloading it, I apologize. Uh, if you do have uh, any problems, uh, just email me afterwards, and I can send you the slides uh, for your uh, files. So we have a lot to cover. It's a long slideshow. I don't know if we'll get to every slide, and I'm going to not try to rush too much through it. Um, but this has been a big year, um, and uh, everybody knows that um, in terms of, uh, you know, that this has been, you know, the year that I would say, I mean, it's got to be a record year in terms of, um, can everybody see everything? I want to make sure that everything is good in terms of, um, Hold on, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty here in terms of getting the slides going. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, hold on. There we go. Okay, so it's been a record year. Uh, we had the highest number of enforcement actions total. Um, 2010 was the previous record. We also had, uh, depending on how you calculate your largest total corporate settlements, uh, we reached about 2.4 billion, um, and uh, that's pretty good. Uh, we had the Teva Pharmaceuticals case, Odebrecht, the portion at least that goes to the United States, which was 10% of about 420 million, depending upon how the valuation comes out. We also had Oxif, the private equity case, and early in the year, earlier in the year, the Bimplecom case, uh, each of which we're going to talk about for a little bit. Um, the numbers in terms of SEC enforcement actions filed, um, we had 25 enforcement actions uh, up from uh, 11 in 2015. Um, in DOJ, uh, we had 11 companies uh, plus three NPAs, non-prosecution agreements, which were down from 14 in 2015. The, you know, the issue with the numbers and this being a big year is we saw some individual prosecutions in, from the SEC, but we've yet to see and we didn't see any uh, from DOJ in terms of uh, criminal cases. And it really raises a question as to how the Yates Memorandum is being enforced, if at all, in the FCPA cases. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, we need to, you know, consider, I think, as we look at such a big year. We also have some slides here which show you how the total corporate fines for this year is a record-setting year, close to $2.4 billion. 2010 was the biggest year before that, and that had the Panalpina case in 2010. Uh, and so that's why you see that uh, as well. Um, if you go to the top 10 corporate SEC settlements, uh, we have several that made it this year. Teva became number four, Odebrecht number five, Oxif number six, Vimplecom number eight. Uh, so we had a bunch of top 10 cases. Uh, this was, uh, to put it mildly, a big year. So. What, what did we see in terms of the cases and what, you know, rationale, what consistency can we see in terms of trends? And there's no question that, and uh, nobody's going to be surprised to hear about this, is uh, the emphasis on ethics and compliance programs. People are absolutely, prosecutors are getting much more uh, sophisticated in terms of their analysis and in terms of digging into the program. Wei Chen, who is the um, 
DOJ Compliance Council, and it's not clear that her contract is going to be renewed. I haven't heard yet what's happening with that. But it's clear that they got into uh, really digging into the details, and I'll show you in some of the cases and how they dug into the details in terms of international controls. The other trend uh, is absolutely the coordination of international enforcement. The Odebrecht case uh, demonstrated that basically Odebrecht almost came to the United States to urge the United States to coordinate the entire case because they saw that they were going to just get bled to death piece through a piecemeal type of prosecution. Brazil may not have been able to you know, resolve the case so quickly. The U.S. was able to push other countries or you know, basically give them one place to resolve uh, all of their cases because they involved close to 14 countries, many of which could have prosecuted them. So the Odebrecht and Bascom case uh, demonstrates that. And we also saw, uh, you know, coordinated settlements were portions of, for example, Vimplecom portions of that went to uh, foreign prosecutors in the Netherlands uh, in other governments. That, to me, is a good sign because it reduces the risk of duplicative prosecutions and it also allows for people to sort of coordinate and, you know, get don't get punished in multiple jurisdictions for the same conduct. Um, so I think these are all good trends. Uh, finally, um, the return of corporate monitors. Monitors now were imposed in eight separate cases. And uh, what we're seeing as a trend is that people are not remediating appropriately, even when they have violations or even when they have significant violations. Uh, companies are not taking the time and the effort to really uh, push this issue and get in place the type of remediation programs that are needed. As a result, corporate monitors are being put in place because the Justice Department just doesn't trust the company to come up with an adequate remediation program. To me, there's an important lesson underneath that. If you're in a company where you have a violation or a series of violations and you decide not to report it, you better make sure that your remediation is going to meet the standards here that uh, DOJ is articulating these days, which is pretty tough. Um, so, uh, like I said, we're seeing the remediation deficiencies, but the standard and the place to go now, uh, we have two places for real good FCPA compliance guidance. One is the 2012 guidance uh, that was issued by DOJ and the FCC and the seven pages that I've urged everybody to read several times called Hallmarks of an Effective Ethics and Compliance or Compliance and Ethics Program. The second place is the remediation section of the FCPA pilot program memo, which was issued on April 1st. Uh, and you really should take a look at that because that you can see Wei Chen's influence and the fact that she has brought into this a whole bunch of issues um, and raising the standards. And that's one of my other themes is that the standards for an effective ethics and compliance program is going up. We, uh, one of the areas where uh, remediation deficiency has been seen is clearly in the lack of discipline of responsible parties, Amber Rare. Lost its, entire, lost its remediation credit because of its failure to punish uh, one person, a senior executive who was aware of, and they think probably knew uh, pretty well, that the bribery conduct was occurring. But that senior executive was not disciplined at all. Notwithstanding the fact that they fired people, uh, that they punished people, uh, the fact that they did not punish or do anything to the senior executive meant that they lost uh, the credit for remediation. And that, in this context, in that context, it was close to probably $20 million. Um, so companies, the message is you have an even greater incentive now to implement a robust uh, program to prevent problems and reduce your exposure in case you do have a problem. So this is, uh, it, it should give you even more ammunition when arguing for resources and the need for an effective and robust compliance program. Compliance program requirements, like I've said, 
uh, Wei Chen has really sort of raised standards and companies are now being held to a higher overall standard. You don't want to be sitting at DOJ and defending your compliance program, especially if she, she's sitting across the table from you. Uh, she knows what's going on in a compliance program and she can very quickly go through it with you and sort of expose some of the weaknesses. A couple other trends. Uh, due diligence and third-party risk management. Now what we're seeing is not just uh, the focus being on whether or not you have a due diligence program. Uh, the enforcement actions, I think, stand for the proposition that we want to see the quality of your due diligence uh, and your program and how it operates procedurally and substantively. And one of the other areas that relates to that is are you obtaining your beneficial ownership information? of your third party partners and your uh, vendors. So we need to um, hold each other to these higher standards for due diligence and third party risk management and demonstrate that not only uh, is there due diligence, uh, but that the quality, the data we're using and that we're considering it. In Oxif's case, they not only conducted due diligence, they identified red flags, but then they engaged in an internal debate in email among senior executives as to whether or not to engage the third party. This process was reviewed and criticized by DOJ, and this means that we've got to tighten our third party systems. We've got to tighten the review mechanism and how we do it. Um, there, like I said, uh, one of the aspects of focusing more on ethics and compliance programs are your uh, internal controls. How are your internal controls working? Um, there, uh, you know, we had two two important points. One is uh, the SEC prosecuted somebody for for violating in the United Airlines case uh, their code of conduct. Does that now mean that our code of conduct? is in fact a rule of law and a rule of our law in our internal control such that if you violate it, you have uh, committed a violation of the FCPA. Number two, uh, invoice to payment controls. Now they're getting much more sophisticated in terms of ripping apart. How do your invoices come in? Who reviews them? How are we making sure these payments are appropriate? How's your AP uh, program work? How do we make sure that it's pursuant to a contract, that it's the right contract amount, and that there is verification of services? So those are some of the trends uh, that I've seen. What's going to happen next year? Well, how will, uh, and everybody's really obsessed and, you know, talking about the new President Trump administration and, and the fact that he's called the law a horrible law, a horrific law and that somehow he's going, not going to enforce the FCPA. Uh, I really think a lot of this talk is uh, malarkey, to be honest with you. The more things change, the more things they are, are the same. And uh, FCPA enforcement right now is, is so entrenched and bipartisan, uh, you know, in comparison to more controversial enforcement programs. I know Senator Sessions very well. I worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I don't expect him to touch this area except for a few modifications, which I'll suggest to you. Um, you know, it's more controversial. You'll probably see, obviously, civ uh, anti uh, civil rights enforcement will be affected, uh, as will Voting Rights Act cases, civil antitrust and merger enforcement in the business area. But going back to FCPA, remember it was the Bush administration that started to ramp this up. Uh, as uh, a way to prevent um, sort of unstable governments from being created and having situations where terrorist organizations could uh, live and expand and so uh, creating uh, more efficient governments was seen as a way to reduce um, uh, the possibility of terrorism. Now, obviously the Obama administration pushed this to an even more aggressive level but I think we're going to uh, see this uh, sort of stay mostly uh, in the same way. I don't think we're going to dismantle sort of the international coalitions that have been built. 
uh, and all the work that's been put in by two administrations to build those global interactions, which include China at this point. So, and politically, I just think it's incredibly difficult to get Congress to try to modify a law that is basically, um, you know, saying we want to have American companies bribe foreign governments. It's just not, it's not something that's going to happen. And I do think people are doomsayers and not really uh, focusing on, on what really is happening on the ground. Um, I think it's going to be another big enforcement year. I think we'll see 2015 was a slow year, 2016 it was slow for the first quarter, but then just picked up uh, incredibly. Uh, I will, we'll probably see more active global investigations. Uh, countries, I think, are, you know, we have a new law. Um, we have a new law that's going on in uh, France that was adopted. Whether or not these get enforced, uh, I think there's very little chance of that. But on the other hand, uh, we may see some upticks in enforcement activity, maybe again in Canada uh, and some other countries. Um, I also think uh, China may reappear in terms of being a domestic uh, enforcer of its anti-corruption laws, uh, just like they did in the GSK case. Um, and I think we might see more of that in 2017. Um, my policy prediction for, for 2017 is really uh, if, and this is in the weeds a little bit, on the FCPA pilot program, which is scheduled to expire in April, um, I do think that there is a chance uh, that we might see a relaxation or uh, a greater benefit that's given. Uh, so right now, if you uh, voluntarily disclose, you cooperate fully, and you remediate, uh, you're entitled to a 50% reduction from the low end of the sentencing guidelines. Um, and I think there was internal debate over that because the FCPA, sort of the fraud political people, wanted to see a declination in those situations when you met the three uh, program requirements. And um, so I think we might see that go to something whereby you're presumed to get a declination, uh, and I think that would be a criteria that would change, which would basically guarantee people uh, a little bit more of uh, a carrot in those situations when they want to disclose and cooperate and remediate. Um, that's, I could see that absolutely happening. That doesn't require a statutory change. That doesn't require anything. The DOJ could do it on its own. Uh, like I said, we've yet to see the Yates memo and individual prosecutions. There's been much talk of that, but we didn't see any individual prosecutions uh, in terms of criminal prosecutions uh, related to these cases. When you read the facts of these cases, there's plenty of targets here. It's, there are plenty of people who could do it uh, and be prosecuted, trust me, when you read through the facts. Why they aren't, I really can't give you an answer unless uh, you know, the corporation is helping them to cooperate and build a case against these individuals, but it just doesn't seem like it's happening. Next year, I think we're going to see some interesting cases. I think Walmart will be resolved. Uh, Microsoft, which has been around for a while, is going to be resolved. Telesonia area, I think, for its Uzbekistan problem, uh, they're in negotiations and already we're talking about paying $1.4 uh, the Walmart case will be interesting because uh, we've had competing leaks. We've had leaks from the defense side and leaks from the prosecution side, uh, arguing about the, what the investigation showed in terms of how much uh, bribery activity actually occurred and what happened. Uh, and I think there will be a lot of pressure for there to be a big case, but it sounds to me like that may come out in the 500 to $600 million range as opposed to some of the other bigger amounts uh, that we've seen with some of the other cases. Um, I do think in terms of compliance predictions for next year, we're going to see, continue to see uh, higher expectations, reviewing recommendations, uh, you know, and remediation by companies that are seeking settlements. Uh, and they, DOJ is on a really big learning curve, and they're really digging into compliance programs so uh, I think we're going to see some more findings and issues relating around adequate resources. Is your compliance program 
adequately resourced? Um, are, is there some active auditing and monitoring going, especially when it comes to your third parties? You have third party audit rights and you should be exercising those audit rights uh, and I would argue at least three uh, to five every year in terms of some kind of audit of your highest risk third parties, monitoring activities, internal controls are being, the, the analysis of internal controls is much more sophisticated and in depth and obviously your third party risk management is always an issue. So I can see all of these issues coming up, but particularly the auditing, the monitoring, proactive auditing steps and what you're taking, that you're not just simply sitting back and relying upon your internal auditor to come up with, hey, here are the places we're gonna do auditing. That compliance is pay, playing a bigger role. I also would urge compliance to play a bigger role in the internal controls front. Um, so those are all issues in terms of crafting the internal controls and, and what type of internal controls you're gonna have. So those are all types of big issues that I think need to um, be looked at in, in greater degree when you're looking at your compliance program. Okay, so we're, there are a lot of cases to go through. We're not gonna go through all of them, uh, but we are gonna go through what I think uh, a lot of them and some sort of general subjects uh, in terms of the uh, cases that occurred last year. Um, and uh, I'm happy to share any other information if you want on any cases or if you have questions about any particular case. Um, what's interesting in the beginning part of the year and it sort of you know, continues on is how many times we see the SEC come out with a healthcare industry company in China, a pharma or a medical device company that got into trouble uh, in the sweep of sort of bribery in China's uh, healthcare industry. This just goes on and on and on and on, and, um, and you can see some common themes that come through them, but there are also some more interesting themes that have come up uh, as well. We had the GSK, which was a resolution, which was finally the closeout of the entire GSK fiasco with the SEC settlement and a $20 million uh, action that was uh, settlement that occurred. Um, and this was again the same conduct that uh, occurred in China's uh, $490 million fine for domestic bribery in 2014. But this it was a wide ranging bribery scheme with gifts, improper travel and entertainment. I mean, even sort of active uh, PowerPoint presentations about um, how you're going to uh, you know, promote the products through these techniques, shopping excursions, gifts to family, and cash, uh, straight out cash. New Skin was an interesting case because uh, it resulted in a relatively small fine, but this was where a Chinese subsidiary made a single uh, payment, and it was a bribe payment, but it was disguised as a charitable donation. And this was the second time that a charitable donation uh, formed the basis of an FCPA charge. But this also, uh, the first one was uh, not in China. And so the New Skin case, if you look at it, it's pretty egregious though in the sense that the surrounding evidence and email traffic shows that uh, it was really pretty outrageous in terms of what they were thinking um, related to uh, when they were giving the charitable, so-called charitable donation, uh, and that it was done with the intent to influence and get, um, you know, greater uh, purchases by uh, the state-owned uh, enterprise in that situation. So then the sweep also involved AstraZeneca, where there was a 5.5 million dollar uh, settlement that again involved a Chinese subsidiary, but also in Russia in bribing a foreign official uh, healthcare providers for product sales. We had Novartis, um, which was a $25 million uh, um, uh, settlement as well. We saw the same fake receipts, uh, which were used uh, extensively in this case. And we had Cyclone, which was a $12.8 million settlement. Um, and there the subsidiary engaged in trips you know, foreign language classes, gifts, money, travel, um, and uh, again, all based in China. And, uh, you know, who knows what uh, programs are being uh, 
uh, put in place to remediate these, um, but they but they definitely need to be. Interestingly, we had two uh, declinations on the, that were announced during the pilot program, and uh, letters were released by DOJ on this. Um, and this was done in a way to sort of promote the pilot program and to bring in uh, more voluntary disclosures, to encourage people to disclose. There's no doubt that the number of voluntary disclosures has gone down. Uh, DOJ is worried about that. That's because lawyers are telling uh, companies, look, you know, take the problem, fix it, remediate it, um, you know, paper it, do everything that you have to do to, to make it uh, fix, you know, fixed and remediated, and just, uh, you know, take the risk that it won't get disclosed. Um, and to counteract that, DOJ is trying to say, look, uh, here are situations where we had a bribery scheme, uh, you know, Nortec Nakami, uh, again in China, uh, again inadequate due diligence, in, you know, ignoring of red flags, but, uh, you know, ongoing bribery activity. Uh, and they met the three requirements. They voluntarily disclosed the issue, they remediated it, and they cooperated it in the investigation, and in the end, they got uh, their, de their declinations. And DOJ is saying, if you do that, you're gonna get a declination. I think uh, we, you know, I've argued that there need to be more incentives uh, and more issue, more ways to encourage companies to come in and report uh, in these situations. Okay, so we had some sort of cleanup cases from uh, the year before. Uh, the SAP official Vincente Garcia uh, was prosecuted and pled uh, guilty last year in 2000 at the end of the year. Uh, and then SAP, the company, for his conduct had to pay $3.9 million. And in this case, it was interesting that, uh, again, we had a local partner who's uh, basically passed bribes and one of the ways that they did it was by discounting or providing deep discounts on the software price to the local partner so that they could then fund a bribery scheme to, a, to the government official. Um, and so Garcia was prosecuted uh, in this case uh, in relation to the SAP uh, case as well. And the, the, the scheme, this was basically in selling software to Panama, uh, to the Panamanian government. The other interesting case that occurred Again, uh, where we had an individual and a company prosecuted by the, S, uh, the SEC and a DPA with uh, the Justice Department was a $22 million settlement against LAN Airlines. Um, and this was not self-reported uh, at all, but it was, uh, there were press reports of corruption, uh, particularly in Argentina. And uh, in here, what was interesting, uh, there were fake consulting agreements that were used to fund a bribery scheme, and these were bribes that were paid to um, a union, and a union to agree in terms of to the land acquisition of various airlines and airline routes. Um, the issue of whether or not the uh, union and the payments violated the FCPA was not really resolved in terms of whether or not the union was state-owned or not, or sufficiently government-connected. Uh, but they didn't really get into that because the failure here were the consulting agreements that were basically fake and used to, to fund, and it was more of an internal controls issue. Um, and at the same time, they had an individual action that was brought against uh, the CEO by uh, the SEC, who, uh, Mr. Plaza, who uh, basically you know, helped to orchestrate this entire scheme. Well, as it turns out, um, they did not discipline Mr. Plaza at all. And under, uh, obviously, there was no remediation because Mr. Plaza continued to operate as the CEO, even though he had this um, uh, SEC violation and was involved in bribery and caused this uh, uh, controls violation, if you want to say. But uh, LAN sort of thumbed their nose at the government, said, hey, we're keeping this guy on. And they said, well, basically, you're going to pay more money because of that. And who knows if they had gotten rid of the CEO, uh, what kind of settlement they probably ultimately would have gotten, probably uh, much lower in my view.
Then we have PTC. PTC is a Massachusetts company, uh, a software company, where they uh, entered into um, a uh, NPA non-prosecution agreement with the Department of Justice. This was early in the year, and this was the first action of the year that Justice was involved in, and it was for $14 million. And then the SEC, you had a, se a civil settlement for $13 million. The interesting thing about this is, and I always cite this as a good example, if you are involved in a company where you do provide travel to foreign state officials or foreign officials to come to your facility or to uh, you know, go to a, de a demonstration or any type of thing, um, and when they're doing these training trips, uh, these people at PTC got a little sophisticated, they thought because they'd bring uh, these state officials for a training trip and it would be you know, one day of PTC, and then it turned into 20 days in total of sightseeing and tourist trips. And they thought they were being cute, I think, in that they were doing partially, uh, they were com you know, sort of complying with the law, um, but there was a lot more that they did on top of that, which was to you know, uh, disguise the codes, but. Uh, basically not comply with their internal control requirements. They made uh, excessive commission payments also uh, as well. And this was really a good example of uh, inadequate uh, due diligence and basically really poor oversight of the sales staff. Uh, there were government, there were gift giving and entertainment with no controls and no sort of supervision in terms of the overall activity. So uh, I always say PTC is a good example for, you know, be careful when you bring foreign officials over, make sure that you're going to do it in the proper way to make sure you comply with the law uh, in terms of doing a training operation and, and having sort of reasonable uh, entertainment and hospitality expenditures that go with that. Uh, one of the worst cases, and I've written and talked a lot about Bimple Palm, uh, is the $795 million settlement, part of which was coordinated with the uh, Netherlands prosecutors. Um, and this was, uh, there, there are two really important points from this. One is uh, we had a shell company uh, and we were purchasing certain assets related to uh, telecom, uh, cellular telephone operations in Uzbekistan from these shell companies. And it turned out that the shell companies, uh, nobody bothered or everybody sort of backed down from getting the ultimate beneficial owner of the shell companies. And if so, they would have found out it was the president's daughter. Um, senior executives actively sought to mislead and circumvent and shut down internal audit reports, shut down uh, lawyers, uh, and ultimately shut down the board. Uh, and the board didn't fulfill its, in my view, corporate governance responsibility to, to get corroboration on who the ultimate beneficial owner was. Uh, this was a perfect example of a governance failure at the boardroom level. Um, and the failure of all of the checks of legal and internal audit. Uh, the good news is that um, a good colleague of mine, friend of mine, Dan Chapman, is the new uh, chief compliance officer there. They've got a monitor there, and I've, uh, if there's anybody who can turn it around, it's going to be Dan Chapman who did it for Parker Drilling. Nonetheless, uh, Vimplecom is, stands as probably one of the most noto notorious and uh, egregious cases uh, that you could see in terms of the FCPA uh, landscape. Olympus was uh, an interesting case, uh, again, early in the year, which was a $22.8 million settlement uh, on FCPA, particularly focused in Central and South America. Interestingly, this was not the real story of the case. The real story of the case was that uh, there was a scheme to pay pick kickbacks in the United States, uh, and uh, which cost under the False Claims Act, which cost Olympus $646 million, uh, in addition to the 22.8 for the FCPA. Here in Central and South America, um, there were these uh, sort of fake training centers or educational institutes that were set up in Latin America, and they basically were used as a way to bring doctors or potential customers into the play, into uh, Olympus uh, areas, and then they were given certain benefits, cash, money transfer, grants, travel, 
free or discounted equipment. These training centers look like they were fake. And again, bringing people to training is okay. Providing reasonable accommodations and hospitality around that training is more than okay. Um, so that's what, um, uh, you know, a legitimate training center could be used for. These training centers were not. They were fake. They were just ways to cover and again, a creative way to try to get uh, money into potential customers' hands um, and to get to get the to get this done. So, um, Qualcomm uh, was the beginning, uh, and I think the you know we already had the uh, BNY Mellon, uh, which was the year before in terms of looking at hiring practices. Uh, Qualcomm started from a whistleblower complaint and eventually ended up with a $7.5 million settlement uh, from the SEC. And uh, this again resulted or was created a situation that came about through hiring practices uh, in China. And we had relatives of Chinese government officials who were being hired in return for obviously increased business with Qualcomm. Um, and uh, here we had internships and where payments and salaries were given, and these were must-place or special hires, meaning people were being hired outside the uh, system, outside the normal hiring practices. Um, and we also had a situation where HR's determination uh, that a person was not qualified for the job was overruled uh, for um, the purposes of uh, satisfying a relative of that uh, person who was a uh, government official. Um, so these, Qualcomm is another sort of in the continuing saga of uh, hiring practices, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, Nordion is uh, an interesting case because we had an individual, uh, there was an individual action against uh, Mikhail uh, Gorupic and um, uh, and he coordinated this scheme where they were bribing Russian officials uh, for drug uh, approvals, and obviously he was connecting to a friend of his. Um, here, uh, look at the nature of the settlement. Only $375,000, there was a more important action against the individual. Uh, and here we had the company self-reported this, fully cooperated, and remediated the problem. So this is another good example of the benefits that you can earn um, and obviously, the, uh, the DOJ declined to, to prosecute in that case. An interesting case on the uh, internal controls issues that I mentioned early on is the Las Vegas Sands case, where we had a $9 million settlement uh, announced in April. And in sort of painful detail, if you read through this, what you see are deficiencies in uh, SANS's internal accounting controls in China and their Macau operations. There was not any instance of bribery that was proven, but there was sort of the risk of bribery and it, it, the apparent smell of bribery um, uh, by anyone because of the accounting controls enforcement uh, and the failure to, and the circumvention of accounting controls. Um, a third party consultant, you know, was sort of at the center of the scandal and, and was was the liaison with the Chinese government, and almost, and according to the calculations, $43 million in payments flowed through this consultant. There was no due diligence until after the consultant was paid, uh, or any of the companies, and the payments, you know, included doing a lot of weird things, buying a building, a high-speed ferry service, uh, basketball team, arts and crafts, and other items. Uh, whether they they basically were not able to you know prove who was underneath these particular assets, which is very hard to do in China, uh, and what the prosecution basically relied on was the, um, the failure to sort of know what they're doing, have a, comply with their accounting controls, um, and to justify why so much money went to this person and for what reason, what were the assets that were involved. So the Las Vegas Sands case was uh, important uh, in, in that uh, respect. Uh, Analogic is a case, again, where we have a DOJ NPA um, and we have an SEC settlement for 11.5. The NPA uh, company 
that was 3.4 million paid by Analogic. Um, we had a Danish subsidiary in Russia that was basically paying bribes through a distributor and shale companies. Um, and some of, again, we had uh, suspicious payments, not bribery necessarily, uh, that was made through at the direction of the distributor. And there were third parties who were never um, identified nor run through any due diligence. Um, and so this, you know, these were payments that were just going out the door, and you can imagine in Russia where those ended up. Um, the, the interesting, and we've seen this in some cases, uh, Analogic's cooperation was not terrific, and they got a harsher penalty because of it. Uh, and it turned out that they, what they did was, uh, as part of their internal investigation, they disclosed information about some of the state-owned entities that they were dealing with, uh, but not all of them. And, uh, and they failed to disclose those, and it's not clear why outside counsel, if they were involved, uh, didn't provide a comprehensive internal investigation report to the Justice Department and left out some employee statements. That just is not a smart thing to do. Um, you know, it, as I always say, if you're going to cooperate, you've got to cooperate all the way, uh, and don't just, uh, and don't just, you know, think that you, um, you know, we're going to do this. So, um, uh, so I would really uh, caution reading through these because there are some others where we had some interesting issues as to the quality of internal investigations that were done before. Analogic included in another individual action by the SEC, which is definitely more active when it comes to individuals, uh, in terms of a case against Lars Frost the former CFO who had to pay a $20,000 uh, civil penalties. Um, he authorized the payments uh, to unknown third parties and he executed uh, falsely uh, SOX uh, sub-certifications as to internal controls uh, and he paid quite a price. But when you look at the facts, it's, uh, he did fairly well given the nature of his conduct and the nature of the violations. Johnson Controls is a really interesting case in my mind. Uh, it's a $14 million settlement with the SEC, a declination from DOJ. I've always thought this is a curious case and curious resolution. Uh, $14 million to the SEC. Um, the, re, Johnson Controls had a prior case, um, and uh, here they acquired a company um, and uh, the, 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 prior, the company that they acquired had resumed uh, bribery activities so using shadow vendors. Uh, they sort of had learned not to use third-party agents um, and to pay for bribery, they used uh, shadow vendors. The interesting part about this to me was that all of this was structured with the full cooperation of everybody in China, 14 or 18 employees in a particular office. And what happened with this is that they designed their payments and their controls uh, and they avoid, they circumvented them by making small payments that didn't require parent, pro, uh, parent approval. So the subsidiary in China was able to basically you know, take out $3,000 at a time or through their delegations of authority and authorize it and, um, and do the payments without anybody at the parent level um, noticing or being required to approve. One of the deficiencies, and this is one issue that I've pushed uh, people to think about, is are your subsidiaries, do you have enough view into your subsidiaries in your uh, high-risk areas? Because here, what was cited in the Johnson Controls case was that the subsidiary was able to operate without any parental uh, oversight. And uh, the only time they'd see the finances is when the finances were rolled up, uh, you know, into the financial reporting system. Um, so, again, what happened was Johnson Controls acquired a company that had just was just coming out of a violation of the FCPA. They remediated it. But nonetheless, the, the, the bribery resumed under Johnson Controls' watch. Um, and this could have been avoided, uh, and there should have been sort of a more uh, robust um, uh, internal control review 
and system put in place to make sure that the Chinese operation could not continue their bribery scheme. Uh, I was surprised, and I, I, I read a column actually sort of uh, raising questions as to why this was resolved this way. Uh, it seemed to me that there should have been um, uh, a more aggressive enforcement given uh, the nature of the situation that they were taking over a company with known violations. Uh, one of the more significant cases and more interesting to me is the, for the year was Octodif. And the reason, not just because it was the first case brought against a private equity company, um, uh, but um, two individuals were charged by the SEC. There certainly are individuals who could be charged. Um, the bribery occurred primarily in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Libya where uh, Libya was a sort of standard situation where uh, they, they had a corrupt agent who was related to Gaddafi. Uh, I think it was his nephew or something. And uh, they made large payments to him and uh, to get investment opportunities with the uh, sovereign wealth fund that's uh, managed by Libya. That was pretty standard. What wasn't standard was uh, the scheme and the way it was operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There, uh, we had a joint venture that was created uh, for Africa, and 40% of it was owned by Oxif. 60%, the bulk of it, was owned by a joint venture partner who turned out to be um, the character, if you've ever seen the movie, which I think is a terrific movie, called Blood Diamond uh, with Leonard DiCaprio. In any event, the Blood Diamond character was the 60% um, partner. Well. Uh, not only were there issues raised about that person uh, for obvious reasons, um, there were serious, serious red flags, and nonetheless, uh, all of the there were all of the red flags were identified. And like I said early in the beginning, all of this was then analyzed and discussed among senior executives, going all the way up to the head of the company. And if there's something you don't want to document, it's an internal debate. Uh, which goes on and on about somebody, then you agree to retain that person as, let's say, your joint venture partner, and then that uh, joint venture partner turns out to be corrupt. There it is. You have all then, you've basically given them the evidence to bring a case against you uh, in terms of the failure of your due diligence process. Um, you know, having these internal debates, uh, you know, memorialized and not setting up a standard procedure for how you review and approve these folks um, and having sort of a freewheeling discussion is not something that I would uh, you know, encourage you to do. The second really important thing was that um, notice that Oxif was held because of a 40% interest in the joint venture, has a minority interest, but nonetheless is held responsible for the entire operation. Well, it turned out it wasn't a situation where they uh, I think the absence of control may have been on paper, but not in practice, because the Justice Department pointed out, look, you have these other issues, the management of the company, the finances, almost all of the money was run by Oxif, even though they had to give 60% e equity to um, the uh, joint venture partner in the uh, entity that ultimately paid all uh, a lot of bribes. The other issue uh, that came up, and I've written about this, is that it seemed to raise some really troublesome issues about transactional due diligence. In other words, uh, individual transactions, for example, a convertible loan, uh, when given to someone like a, a third party, the question is, is how do you uh, deal with that if the stock is not exercised? In other words, the the stock is not the equitable interest is never converted. Uh, they seem to suggest that due diligence was required at the moment that you make the convertible loan. They seem to suggest there should be greater due diligence when you're just making a large payment altogether. And it made to me, it raised the prospect of transactional due diligence requirements against companies involving large transactions or suspicious transactions. So not only are we now in due diligence situations for who the person is, should we create a relationship with them, but now we have to start to look at each transaction and almost document a uh, due diligence type of review of that transaction. 
that seems to me to be raising some real serious issues as to when and how you exercise due diligence and your monitoring function uh, in these uh, in private equity, but in any other type of industry uh, as well. Amber Rare finally was settled, as I said, you know, finally landed. It was a $187 million settlement. Um, there was bribery by the uh, aircraft manufacturer in Brazil, Saudi Arabia, the Dominican Republic. Interestingly, uh, you know, to, to make payments in the Dominican Republic, they brought an agent over from the Middle East and never explained why this agent was needed or why that agent had any expertise in the Dominican Republic, but nonetheless uh, brought them over and had them make the payments. Um, so this was a sort of classic bribery scheme uh, using third parties and third party agents everywhere. Uh, we had the sham agency agreements um, and uh, uh, money that was a contract that was hidden. I mean, there was a lot of skullduggery in this one, a uh, contract hidden in a safe deposit box in Switzerland. Um, but in any event, these were interesting. Um, a lot of people were prosecuted in Brazil. Saudi Arabia and the Dominican Republic so that there were not individuals to prosecute in the United States. Um, uh, there also were internal control violations in India, but bribery again was not specifically alleged, probably because they couldn't get to the bottom of it. Uh, and again, remember the point I made earlier, there was no remediation credit given to the company uh, because of its failure to uh, discipline a particular uh, senior official, uh, which is a big point. J.P. Morgan, the sons and daughters case, quid pro quo, hiring, um, you know, look, they gave the government a great piece of evidence, which was a chart that included, okay, here's the government contract, here's the responsible official, here are the sons and daughters, let's hire the sons and daughters and go through with this. Um, this was handled by uh, um, uh, a very good attorney, the former head of the FCPA unit, uh, who was able to get a non-prosecution agreement and avoid a monitor in this situation, even though the hiring sons and daughters program was pretty open and notorious, uh, and um, they basically uh, knew exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it, and there were documents, uh, the intent in terms of this was documented very well. Obviously, they argued at great length that this is not the giving uh, of anything of value under the uh, FCPA and they lost that argument pretty convincingly. Um, what this does mean though, in my mind, is uh, you have to look at your hiring practice, look at hiring of former government officials and relatives, and make sure you have control surrounding uh, those hirings to make sure that there, there's no favoritism. It doesn't mean you can't hire a relative. It just means uh, that you can only um, do so uh, pursuant to controls to make sure that they're qualified, that they deserve uh, the position that they get and that they're not being selected uh, just because of that uh, relationship. Odebrecht is uh, obviously an important case and we've talked about that. Uh, the $3.5 billion global settlement, approximately $420 million to the U.S. Treasury. Uh, Brascom, the related subsidiary, I mean, this was just uh, flagrant institutionalized bribery. I mean, they even had a corporate structure. They had a division that was set up for uh, structured or operations. You had attempts to obstruct justice by destroying evidence in a meeting to do so. I mean, you couldn't ask for a more sort of a stronger case in terms of criminal operations, and we had 12 countries that were involved in bribery being paid all over the world. Whether Odebrecht, uh, you know, is able to recover, it really depends upon, I think, uh, the corporate leadership and the monitor uh, as to what they ultimately are able to accomplish. But it certainly uh, raises uh, huge problems because this is institutionalized, this is systematic, this is just like uh, Siemens, this is like some of the more egregious cases that we can imagine when a company is basically taken over by a criminal scheme and it operates side by side with the business. And at the very end we had, uh, not at the very end, but close to the end, we had Teva Pharmaceuticals with the largest case against the pharmaceutical company 
Uh, the largest up to, and interestingly, for $519 million total, interestingly, the largest case before that was Johnson & Johnson, which was approximately $70 million. So look at the change in terms of penalties, but also look at the uh, egregious conduct we had here in terms of taking a Russian company, and uh, which was owned by a foreign official, and they sort of papered the foreign official in the company as basically that they were repackaging and marketing a product. Uh, but it was basically a way to provide an equity interest uh, in a company or uh, have this separate company which was basically being bribed. Uh, they did similar, uh, similar type of activity in the Ukraine where they influenced uh, the registration of pharmaceutical pro products related to uh, Copaxone. It was the name of the product uh, used for the treatment of MS. Um, and again, uh, the jurisdiction and connection to the U.S. was based on emails and payments going through bank accounts in the United States, but nonetheless, look how Teva got uh, put into the hook here uh, for $519 million. Uh, and just in between sort of, uh, you know, Christmas and New Year's this year, uh, DOJ had two more cases uh, to roll out. Uh, the first was uh, this interesting six individuals criminally prosecuted, clearly with the U.S. Attorney's Office down in Texas in the lead. Um, and the scheme involved uh, bribing Mexican officials. There were clearly undercover recordings or, you know, informant recordings that were made to get these aircraft maintenance and repair contracts with the uh, Mexican government. Uh, and the individuals were uh, all... Uh, all pled guilty um, and all uh, basically uh, in open and notorious bribery uh, where they basically put commissions on the paperwork, but it was a relatively small sort of aviation company. But nonetheless, uh, I guess in an attempt to try to get uh, some Yates credit here, we have six individuals. But none of these individuals, again, are connected to any of the larger corporate cases that occurred this year. And that, to me, is still uh, the headline story um, of the year in terms of that. General Cable, which was uh, also settled uh, before the end uh, uh, before the end of the year, um, and um, General Cable uh, basically paid seventy five point eight million dollars, but they earned a lot, uh, and they earned an NPA from the Justice Department. And I'll tell you what, if you want to look at uh, you know, sort of a well-done job by a company in terms of self-disclosing, credit for cooperation, and extensive remedial measures, um, and for pretty, you know, wide-ranging conduct, this is a very good example and uh, they, that they did not get a deferred prosecution agreement. Um, and so, to me, uh, General Cable, which was involved in bribery, particularly in Angola, that's where most of the conduct occurred and most of the egregious conduct occurred, um, but nonetheless was able to avoid uh, a deferred prosecution agreement, a monitor, uh, and that's because even though they had bad conduct, they, they took advantage of all three of the elements of the pilot program uh, to get them into a uh, situation. And notice in the remediation, they, uh, you know, they got rid of 13 employees who participated in this. Going back to the uh, Morgan Stanley case, J.P. Morgan case, what struck me, for example, in the remediation in that was that they really hit a lot of people hard, not only with firing people, but they also took all financial benefits and bonuses away from people who knew or should have known uh, about the bribery scheme. So when we talk about remediation, remember, you've got to be tough on the people involved and tough on the people who are involved in the supervision uh, of that as well. So thank you. I know that was rushed. We had a lot to do. We didn't do every case. Uh, we did a lot of them, but uh, didn't do every case. Remember to keep us in mind for work. Uh, some people responded positively to our question about uh, contact, and we will be in uh, for potential work uh, in ways that we can collaborate with you. Um, please continue to follow us on, on our, our blog. Our, we have a new website. Uh, and we have uh, these um, webinars are recorded and then are placed on Volkoff Law TV, which you can subscribe to 
uh, as well. Thank you again. Now, remember, if you didn't get a copy of the slides, uh, you weren't able to download them, please just email me at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com, and we'll be happy to send you the slides. Uh, call me anytime you have any questions. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. This is going to be a great year, hopefully, for everyone. And uh, thank you for attending and appreciate it.